Hello. Welcome to this evening with Louis Menand, part of the Democracy Forum lecture series at Elmhurst College. This lecture has been selected to be recorded for Chicago Amplified, a web-based audio program produced by WBEZ Chicago that captures some of the most exciting and informative progr cultural programming in the Chicago area. In your printed program, you'll find out how you can hear this lecture again or share it with others on Chicago Amplified. At this time, I'd like to ask that you please make sure your cell phones are turned off. And now I'm proud to introduce the president of Elmhurst College, Dr. S. Allen Ray. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you. Civic engagement is the lifeblood of a democracy. An engaged public is critical if the nation is to elect sensible public officials and make wise policy choices. But the democratic process, I think you would agree, has been stymied recently by partisanship and by gridlock, which tends to discourage participation in the political process. With a presidential contest to play out in the months ahead, the strengths and flaws of our democratic process will be all the more evident. With the presidential election in mind, I'm pleased to uh, announce a last minute addition to our schedule Elmhurst College will be hosting a visit from New Jersey Governor Chris Christie tomorrow, Friday, at noon here in the Founders Lounge. Governor Christie will be speaking in support of Governor Mitt Romney in his bid for the presidency. You should know Elmhurst College routinely invites all major candidates for public office to our campus to speak. We're pleased that Governor Romney has asked Governor Christie to appear on his behalf, and you're all welcome to attend. In response to our country's struggles with culture and politics in contemporary American society, Elmhurst College has launched the Democracy Forum, a series of lectures that shine a light on key matters of our civic light. It is our hope that lectures and discussions like the one this evening can point to the kinds of solutions that seem to elude policymakers. The lectures in our series also explore issues of access, access to education, to information, to economic and political opportunity, and consider whether and under what conditions a level playing field or true democracy might be achieved in the United States. The exploration of democracy and civic engagement make, marks the third consecutive year that the college has developed programming, speakers, and events around a larger theme. In 2009, 2010, you may recall, the Poverty Project captured our efforts to explore the everyday scandal of material poverty. This past academic year, Still speaking, conversations on faith presented dialogues on faith, its varieties, contradictions, and influence in the modern world. Still speaking also marked the beginning of the centennial celebration of the graduation of Elmhurst's esteemed alumni, theologians Reinhold Niebuhr, class of 1910, and H. Richard Niebuhr, class of 1912. This year, the Democracy Forum has been host to speakers, including author and radio host Michael Eric Dyson, Senior analyst for CNN and staff writer for The New Yorker, Jeffrey Tubin, journalist and former editor of Newsweek, John Meacham, Chicago civic leader, Jerry Chico, political consultant and author, Naomi Wolf, Senator Mark Kirk, and noted author and public intellectual, Robert Putnam. Still to come this spring in the Democracy Forum series are Fox News analyst, Katie McFarland, and renowned journalist and author, Bob Woodward, who will be in conversation with Judge William Bauer a member of the Seventh Circuit Court of, Pres of Appeals and a longtime Elmhurst College trustee and an alumnus of the college. To introduce tonight's speaker, it's my pleasure to present Dr. Diane Chambers, Professor of English. Professor Chambers specializes in the teaching of English, American literature, modernism and postmodernism, women's writing, late 19th century Chicago women's clubs, literary theory, and young adult and children's literature. I present Professor Chambers. Good evening. Our speaker tonight is Louis Menand. Uh, he is the Ann T. and Robert B. Bass Professor of English at Harvard University. Professor Menand is one of those rare individuals whose work straddles the worlds of both academia and popular high culture. His book, The Metaphysical Club, A Story of Ideas in America, won the Pulitzer Prize for History in 2002. 
The book provides an intellectual and cultural history of the late 19th and early 20th century America. His most recent book, The Marketplace of Ideas, Reform and Resistance in the American University, is about the future of higher education in America. He has been an associate editor at the New Republic, literary editor of the New York Review of Books, uh, and literary, sorry. Um, since 2001, he has been a staff writer at the New Yorker. Professor Menand has also taught at Princeton, Queens College, and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, where he was Distinguished Professor of English. We are very happy to have him here today. Please give a warm welcome to Louis Menand. Thank you very much. Uh, President Ray told me that the weather in March is always like this <laughs> at Elmhurst College. So <clears throat> uh, I'm very glad to be here, and thank you for coming indoors um, on this beautiful day. American taxpayers spend $118 billion a year to support higher education. Students pay $122 billion a year in tuition. Total annual revenue at all colleges and universities, including public, private, and for-profit schools, from all sources, including grants, gifts, and endowment income, is $355 billion. There are 4,474 institutions of higher learning in the United States and more than 20 million students, about 6% of the population. Higher education is a big social investment. Why do we make that investment? And is the system giving us the results that we want? <clears throat> so that I won't disappoint you later, or won't disappoint you too much later, I'll say right now that I'm not going to be making any predictions about the future of higher education. I'm really bad at predictions. If I were good at it, I would have chosen a different line of work. And I try to avoid making predictions. I'm an historian. I predict the present. I look backwards and I connect the dots that explain how we got to where we are. <clears throat> My view about the future is simply that it is good to think of it as in our hands. If we believe that the future is in our hands, then it's helpful to know how the conditions in which we find ourselves came to be. And that's what historians can be helpful about. Regarded functionally, the higher education system as a whole is designed to produce and disseminate knowledge. It's intended to enable people to acquire knowledge, to publish it, and to teach it. The system is supposed to operate as a marketplace rather than a factory or a penitentiary in the sense that it's supposed to separate good knowledge from less good knowledge entirely according to merit. On the analogy of the way that a free market economy is supposed to get us the best product for the least cost. The higher education system is supposed to select and reward scholars, researchers, and students without fear or favor, and to ensure that new knowledge is worthwhile knowledge by subjecting it to the system's quality controls. As with a free market economy, the operation of the higher education system can be affected by exogenous factors, such as politics or money, but also by internal factors, such as a recalcitrant institutional culture or baked-in systemic distortions. In other words, the system can become sticky in ways that interfere with its efficiency and its effectiveness. One way this can happen is when there's a lack of clarity about the overall mission of higher education. Such a lack of clarity is encountered more often than one might imagine. One of the reasons is that people disagree about what the mission of higher education ought to be. Another reason is that professors are trained to know a lot about the area of expertise that they work in, but almost nothing about anything else, including the purpose of higher education as a whole. 
if they have views, and they commonly do have views, having views about things is one of the reasons they became professors, those views are often ad hoc or inconsistent with one another or highly impractical. <clears throat> so what might be the mission or missions of American higher education as a whole? I'm going to talk mainly about the part of the higher education system that I assume is of most interest to most of us today, which is college. But we'll see, as we'll see, there are various kinds of colleges within the American higher education system. And the role that colleges play is related to the roles played by other parts of the system, such as graduate education, professional education, and adult education. So I'll have less to say about those things, but they're part of the picture. So why do we have college? In the United States since 1945, there have been three theories. First theory goes like this. In any group of people, it's easy to determine who is the fastest, who is the strongest, even usually who is the best looking. But picking out the most intelligent person is difficult because intelligence involves many attributes that can't be captured in a one-time assessment, like an IQ test. There is no intellectual equivalent to the 100-yard dash. An intelligent person is open-minded, an outside-the-box thinker, an effective communicator, is prudent, self-critical, consistent, and so on. Those are not qualities that are readily subject to measurement. But society needs a mechanism for sorting out its more intelligent members from its less intelligent ones, just as a track team needs a mechanism like a stopwatch for sorting out the faster athletes from the slower ones. Society wants to identify intelligent people early on so that it can funnel them into careers that maximize their talents. We want to get the most out of our human resources. College is a process that is sufficiently multifaceted and fine-grained to do this. On this theory, college is essentially a four-year intelligence test. Students have to demonstrate intellectual ability over time and across a range of subject matters. If they're sloppy, or inflexible or obnoxious, no matter how smart they might be in the IQ sense, those negatives will get picked up in their grades. As an added service, college also sorts people according to aptitude. It separates the math types from the poetry types. At the end of the process, students get a score, the GPA, that professional schools and employers can trust as a measure of intellectual capacity and productive potential. The name for this theory is the theory of meritocracy. Let's call this theory one. On theory one, the educational system is principally about selection. This isn't just the case for the students, it's the case for the teachers as well. The theory calls for a big commitment of time and resources to the business of making sure that the right people get admitted into the system, get promoted within the system, and get rewarded by the system, and that the wrong people or the less right people do not. At elite institutions especially, nothing is taken more seriously than this vetting process. So that's one theory. Suppose we wanted a system that was primarily not about selection but about inclusion. Then we might prefer a different theory of college. Let's call it theory two. On this theory, in a society that encourages its members to pursue the career paths that promise the greatest personal or financial rewards, people, given a choice, will learn only what they need to know for success. They will have no interest or incentive to acquire the knowledge and skills important for life as an informed citizen or as a reflective and culturally literate human being. College gives future citizens exposure to knowledge that enlightens and empowers them, whatever careers they ultimately end up choosing. In performing this function, college also socializes. It takes people with disparate backgrounds and beliefs and brings them into line with mainstream norms of reason and taste. Independence of mind is tolerated in college, it's even honored, but students have to master the accepted way of doing things before they're permitted to deviate from them. Ideally, on this theory, we want everyone to go to college because college gets everyone on the same page. It's a way of producing a society of like-minded grown-ups, of citizens. This might be called the democratic theory of college. 
If you like theory one, it doesn't matter which courses students take or even what's taught in them, as long as they're rigorous enough for the sorting mechanism to do its work. The only thing that matters is the grades and other forms of evaluation, such as recommendation letters, test scores, the GREs, MCATs, LSATs, and so on. If the courses are challenging and the subjects are varied, then a student's overall record will be a meaningful measure of relative intelligence. If you prefer theory two, then you might consider grades a useful instrument of positive or negative reinforcement, but what matters is what students actually learn. You think there is stuff that every adult ought to know, and the college is a good delivery system for getting that stuff into their heads. A lot of confusion is caused by the fact that since 1945, American higher education has been committed to both theories. The system is designed to be both meritocratic, theory one, and democratic, theory two. Professional schools and employers depend on college, colleges to sort out each cohort as it passes into the workforce, and we also talk about the importance of college for everyone. We want higher education to be available to all Americans, but we also want people to deserve the grades they receive. It wasn't always like this. Before 1945, elite private colleges like Harvard and Yale were largely in the business of reproducing a privileged social class. Between 1906 and 1932, 405 boys from the Groton School applied to Harvard. 402 were accepted. 1932, Yale received 1,300 applications. It admitted 959. The acceptance rate was 74%. Of the 844 who, en who enrolled, 31% were sons of Yale graduates. 1948, through the exertions of people like James Conant, the president of Harvard, the Educational Testing Service was established and standardized testing, the SATs and the ACTs, became the virtual universal method for picking out the most intelligent students in the high school population, regardless of family background, and getting them into the higher education system. James Conant did not think the college was for everyone. He regarded higher education as a limited social resource, and he wanted to make the entrance gate narrower. He thought testing would ensure that the only people who got to college were people who deserved to go to college. The fact that their daddy went there was no longer good enough. In 1940, the acceptance rate at Harvard was 85%. By 1970, it was 20%. Last year, it was 6%. But as private colleges became more selective, public colleges became more accommodating. And proportionally, the growth in higher education since 1945 has been overwhelmingly in the public sector. 1950, there were about 1.1 million students in public colleges and universities, about the same number in private colleges and universities. Today, public colleges enroll 15 million students, private colleges less than 4 million. There's now a seat for virtually everyone with a high school diploma who wants to attend college. At City University of New York, where I used to work, they have 212,000 undergraduates, almost four times as many as the entire Ivy League. The New York State system, SUNY, has 64 campuses and 426,000 undergraduates. The big enchilada of public higher education, the state of California, has 10 university campuses, 23 state college campuses, 110 community college campuses, and more than 1.2 million students. Now, if you're a theory one person, meritocracy theory, then you worry that with so many Americans going to college, the bachelor's degree is losing its meaning. You worry that will no longer operate as a reliable indicator of intelligence or productive potential. You think increasing, increasing public investment in higher education with the goal of college for everyone is thwarting the operation of the sorting mechanism. If you're friendly towards theory two, on the other hand, the democratic theory, you worry that the competition for slots in top-tier colleges is warping educational priorities. You see academic tulip mania. Students and their parents are overvaluing a commodity for which there are cheap and plentiful substitutes. Their sticker price at a place like Princeton or Stanford is north of $50,000 a year. Public colleges are generally much less expensive, and there are also many less selective private colleges where you can get a great education. 
you think, a theory two person, you think that education is about personal intellectual growth. It's not about winning a race to the top. In the United States, the term college is often used to connote liberal education. That is, an education consisting of courses in the liberal arts and sciences. What are the liberal arts and sciences? They're fields in which knowledge is pursued disinterestedly, without regard for financial, political, or vocational considerations. Disinterested does not, disinterestedness does not mean that professors are open to equally open to any point of view. Professors are hired because they have views about their subject, and those views exclude other views. Disinterested, dis, disinterestedness just means that whatever views a professor holds, those views have been arrived at unconstrained or as unconstrained as possible by anything except the requirement of honesty. When pressure is put on higher education to justify the social investment, liberal education is usually the target because people want to know what is the real world value of majoring in fields like theoretical physics or French literature. 60% of American college students are not liberal arts majors. The number one major in America, undergraduate major, is business. 22% of all bachelor's degrees are awarded in business. 10% are awarded in education. 7% in the health professions. More than twice as many degrees are given out every year in parks, recreation, leisure, and fitness studies as in philosophy and religion. There are many more degrees every year in social work than in sociology. So those are not liberal fields. Only 4% of bachelor's degrees are awarded in English, only 2% in history. And the more higher education expands, the larger the system gets, the more the liberal arts sector shrinks in proportion to the whole. And neither theory one nor theory two really explain completely how higher education works for these students, the ones majoring in business or education. The theory is, the theory that applies to them is that advanced economies demand specialized knowledge and skills. Since high school is aimed at the general learner, college is where people can be taught what they need to know in order to enter a vocation. College degree in a non-liberal field signifies competence in a specific line of work. You're being trained to do a job. This theory, theory three, explains the growth of the non-liberal education sector. As work becomes more high tech, employers demand more people with specialized training. It also explains the explosion in professional master's programs. There are now well over 100 master's degrees available in fields from aviary medicine to web design to homeland security. There are almost 10 times as many master's degrees as PhDs awarded every year, and more than six times as many master's degrees as professional degrees, such as law and medicine. There are almost as many master's degrees awarded every year as there are associate's degrees, that is, community college degrees. When Barack Obama and Arne Duncan talk about how higher education is the key to the future of the American economy, this is the sector that they have in mind. They're not talking about the liberal arts. Excuse me. <clears throat> Still, students who are pursuing a vocational degree or a non-liberal arts degree are almost always required to take courses in liberal arts and sciences. I'll give you an example from the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. If you major in culinary arts management at UNLV, you're required to take two courses in English, one course in philosophy, one course in either history or political science, and courses in chemistry, mathematics, economics, plus two electives in the arts and humanities. This is, in fact, a distinctive feature of American college education. Even in places where students, most students are majoring in a non-liberal field, students receive, to some extent, a liberal education. On the face of it, the American higher education system is a success. Uh, more than 70% of high school graduates go on to college. In 1980, only 49% went on. So access to the system is robust. People can get in. And employers continue to reward the credential, the bachelor's degree, which means there's still some selection going on. In 2008, the average income for someone with an advanced degree, master's professional or doctoral degree, was $83,000.
for someone with a bachelor's degree, 58,000. Someone with only a high school education was 30,000. There's also increasing demand globally for American style higher education. People want to come here from all around the world to go to college in the United States. And some American universities, including NYU and Yale, are building campuses overseas. Higher education is widely regarded as the route to a better life. <clears throat> now, it's possible, of course, that the system only looks like it's working. The process may be sorting, students may be getting access, employers may be rewarding, but are people actually learning anything? This is the current high stakes issue in higher education, measuring outcomes. Are certain students learning what we want them to know? Do we even know what we want them to know? <clears throat> Those questions are harder to answer than one might hope. And there are several reasons for this. One has to do with the empirical difficulty of assessing educational success and failure. When you bring your car into the shop to be repaired, the difference between the car when you brought it in and the car when you picked it up is entirely due to the work done in the shop. We say that the difference between the broken car and the fixed car is a treatment effect. The car did not get better on its own. College is not so straightforward. People become educated. You can't really stop them. Between the ages of 18 and 22, most people undergo a developmental leap that is similar to the developmental leaps they make between 2 and 4 or between 11 and 13. People don't get fussier or hairier between 18 and 22, but they do change intellectually. Every professor sees the change between freshman year and junior or senior year in their students. This is why, for example, SAT scores do not predict college grades past the freshman year. You just can't tell what a person will be like when they're 20 or 22 from what they're like when they're 16 or 17 years old. Is this transformation that college students just seem naturally to undergo because they learned a lot of specific knowledge that we've taught them or just because they've started to think more broadly and creatively because they've become mature adults? And which sort of attainment are we teaching? Are we teaching them to know stuff or are we teaching them to think more broadly and creatively? Then there's the additional problem that to a considerable extent, college education can be explained in terms of selection rather than in terms of treatment. Let's say Elmhurst wants to give its students an education that will make them tolerant, open-minded, and principled human beings. Elmhurst does not admit students who are bigoted, dogmatic, and wicked. Elmhurst selects applicants who already demonstrate at a pretty high level the traits that Elmhurst aspires to inculcate. And the people who apply to college select Elmhurst because they already have a lot of what Elmhurst wants to give them. All along the lines of their educational career, they've continually been selected for already having the qualities education is supposed to impart. Now, if you go far enough along the line in that way, you become a professor. <laughs> how much of the education, how much of the intellectual and moral character of the college graduate, let's say the Elmhurst graduate, is a treatment effect, something that happened while they were here, is how much is a selection effect. This is the kind of person they always were. We could put the question the other way around. Are there things that Elmhurst could do that would actually make its students less principled, tolerant, and open-minded than they would otherwise be. Then there's another difficulty in reaching agreement about what it is we want students to know, and this has to do with the way liberal education evolved during the second half of the 19th century, and that's, of course, when the modern higher education system in the United States came into being. The university is an ancient institution. I was once visiting New College, which is one of the 39 colleges that make up the University of Oxford. And I asked the warden, uh, so how new is New College? I thought that was a clever question. <laughs> he said, it's pretty new, only about 900 years old. New College was founded in 1379. Uh, so Harvard and Yale are 17th century colleges, of course. And in writing on higher education, you, you sometimes hear reference to uh, the educational priorities of that era about the trivium and the quadrivium, or about training ministers or gentlemen and so forth. But the modern American university, the place we work, really has nothing to do with those things. The modern American university is really, really new. It's only about 150 years old. And it's so different from what came, to for, what came before it that makes the sense to think of it as a new institutional entity. 
One thing that's striking looking back at that period between the Civil War and the First World War, which is when the modern university came into being, was the role as the role that was played by a tiny group of individuals, university professors. They were titans in their world. They had power and they used it. Some of them built institutions from nothing, like Daniel Gilman at Hopkins, William Rainey Harper at Chicago, Davis Starr Jordan at Stanford. Others transformed existing institutions, like Nicholas Murray Butler at Columbia, Timothy Dwight at Yale. 21st century university presidents who have so little control over the academic mission of their institutions must look back at those men and weep bitter tears. <laughs> of these titans, the first, the longest serving, and for my purposes, the most important, uh, was Charles William Eliot of Harvard. Eliot became president of Harvard in 1869. His academic field was chemistry, but he was not a particularly accomplished chemist. In fact, he had resigned from the Harvard faculty in 1863 because he'd been passed over for a chair in chemistry. When the Harvard overseers selected him to be the new president six years later, he was working in what many at the time would have regarded as a vocational school, MIT. <laughs> uh, the overseers were taking a radical step in appointing Eliot. His appointment constituted recognition that American higher education was changing, that Harvard was in danger of losing its prestige. Harvard picked Eliot because it wanted to be reformed, and Eliot did not disappoint. He was inaugurated in the fall of 1869, and he served for 40 years. By the time he retired, Eliot had become identified with almost everything that distinguishes the modern research university from the antebellum college. The abandonment of the role of in loco parentis, the abolition of required coursework, the introduction of an elective system for undergraduates, the establishment of graduate schools with doctoral programs in the arts and sciences, and the emergence of research as a principal component of the university's mission. Eliot played a prominent part in all these developments. He was, after all, a prominent figure at a prominent school. But he was not their originator. Other colleges instituted many of these reforms well before Harvard did. Eliot's role was to some extent reactive. He was a quick student of trends, and he was an aggressive implementer of change. He adopted a there's a new sheriff in town attitude towards his faculty, an attitude that has not always proved successful for Harvard presidents. <laughs> but he did bring one original and revolutionary idea with him when he came into office, and this was to make the bachelor's degree a prerequisite for admission to professional school. It may seem like a minor reform, but it was possibly the key element in the transformation of American higher education in the decades after the Civil War. <clears throat> Before Eliot, students could choose between college and professional school, law, medicine, or science, which in the 19th century was taught at a school separate from the college, at MIT, for example. In 1869, Eliot's first year as president, Half the students at Harvard Law School and nearly three quarters of the students at Harvard Medical School had never gone to college, did not have undergraduate degrees. And those were respectable numbers. Of 411 medical students at the University of Michigan, only 19 had gone to college, and none of the 387 law students at Michigan had prior degrees of any kind. Harvard Law School had no admissions requirements <clears throat> beyond evidence of good character and the ability to pay the $100 tuition, which went into the pockets of the law professors. There were, no, there were no grades or examinations at Harvard Law School. Students often left before the end of the two-year curriculum to go to work. They got their degrees anyway. <clears throat> to get an MD at Harvard Medical School in 1869, students took a 90-minute oral examination, during which nine students rotated among nine professors all sitting in one large room, spending 10 minutes with each. When the 90 minutes were up, a bell was sounded, and the professors, without consulting one another, marked pass or fail for their fields on a chalkboard. Any student who passed five of the nine fields became a doctor. <laughs> now, Charles William Eliot thought the situation was scandalous, and he published an article about it in the Atlantic Monthly in 1869, just a few months before being offered the presidency, and that article was almost certainly a factor in the decision to offer him the job. The reason Harvard wanted a reformer was because there was evidence in the 1860s that college enrollments were in decline, and it's easy to see why. 
the professional school option allowed students to skip college altogether. Once he was installed, <clears throat> Elliot immediately set about instituting admissions and graduation requirements at Harvard schools of medicine, law, divinity, and science, and forcing those schools to develop meaningful curricula. It took a long time. A bachelor's degree was not required for admission to Harvard Medical School until 1900. Elliot had two goals in mind. One was to raise the value of the professional degree. His reform professionalized the professions. It made it harder to get into law or medicine, required future doctors and lawyers to spend four years of liberal education before entering professional training programs. This made the professions more selective and thereby raised the social status of law, medicine, and science and engineering. His second goal was to save the liberal arts college. Elliot understood that in an expanding nation, social and economic power would pass to people who, regardless of birth or inheritance, possessed specialized expertise. If a liberal education remained an optional luxury for th those people, then college would wither away. By making college the gateway to the professions, Elliot linked the college to the rising fortunes of this new professional class. But, and this is the key point, Elliot insisted on keeping college education, liberal education, separate from professional and vocational education. He thought professional education is utilitarian. You learn what is professionally profitable to know. But the collegiate ideal, as he put it in the Atlantic Monthly article, is, quote, the enthusiastic study of subjects for the love of them without any ulterior objects, end quote. College was about knowledge for its own sake. At Elliott's Harvard undergraduate undergraduates could take any courses they liked. There was no major. In fact, the major was not invented in American higher education until 1910. There were only two graduation requirements at Harvard under Elliott. He had to take a course in expository writing and foreign language. The result was that the senior graduating class in 1900 had taken nothing but introductory courses for four years. Effectively, in other words, Elliott struck a deal. Professional schools would require a bachelor's degree for admission, and in return, colleges would not provide pre-professional instruction. The college curriculum would be non-vocational. And that's the system we've inherited. Liberalization first, then professionalization. Two types of education are kept separate. So let's return to the question that we started with. How does a liberal education treat young people such that their chances for a productive life are enhanced. So you can see that one of the reasons this is hard to answer is because we've inherited from the 19th century a system in which college is associated with the ideals of the love of learning and knowledge for its own sake, in which education for a vocation or profession is left to graduate school. And just as in such a system, the liberal arts college has developed an allergy to certain terms like vocationalist or instrumentalist or practical or presentist. In other words, the vocabulary that we would normally use to define the utility or the value of something uh, is largely out of bounds when it comes to liberal education. Educators have to find a way to justify the social and personal investment in college without recourse to the language of vocationalism or professionalism or even utilitarianism. Those are all terms that trigger the system's autoimmune system. So let's think about those terms for a minute. There's a little self-deception in complaints about vocationalism, because there is one vocation for which liberal education is not only useful, but deliberately designed, the vocation of professor. The undergraduate major in English is essentially a preparation for graduate work in English, which leads to a professional position of English professor. The major is set up in such a way that the students who receive the top marks are the ones who show the greatest likelihood of going on to graduate school and becoming professors themselves. So that's not merely knowledge for its own sake. It's a kind of professional training. It also seems strange to accuse any educational program of being instrumentalist. Knowledge just is instrumental. It puts us into a different relationship with the world. And that relationship between what professors study and teach and what's going on in the world that our graduates will enter that's what makes colleges continually need to reform their curricula. It's a good thing when you feel your curriculum is outdated because it's an opportunity to reshape it in light of contemporary needs. Faculty always need to ask, are we preparing our students for the world they are about to enter, not the world that we entered?
And of course, this question is presentist. If the faculty thinks that a curriculum in which students spend most of four years being trained in an academic specialty is not going to prepare them for, a world, for the world of today, then they usually try to implement a set of general education requirements that ensure that every student will learn something that does prepare him or her. If we're just justifying our curricular choices simply on the basis of research priorities, we're not doing our jobs. <coughs> Let's say if we did want to define the value of liberal education a little more concretely than this, what terms would we use? We could say that liberal education basically teaches three things, three things that you get little or none of in most professional educational programs. The first is methodology. That's something you do get a little bit of, of course, in professional school. We might call it protocols for inquiry. Liberal education teaches students how to assemble, interpret, and evaluate data how to turn information into knowledge. The methods college teaches for doing these things range from statistics to hermeneutics. Second, a great deal of liberal education is historical. Not only what's taught in history departments, but a great deal of what's taught in literature and the arts, some of what's taught in philosophy. Historical study gives students the backstory of present arrangements. It allows them to appreciate the contingent nature of those arrangements. And so to see possibilities for changing them if they someday might wish to, or to understand the real reasons for not changing them if they wish not to. History helps them see, ideally, that there is no one way that things must be, that the future is in their hands. And third, a great deal of liberal education is theoretical or philosophical. We teach material in a way that helps students apprehend the structure of assumptions that underwrite our practices. We undertake to expose to them the logic of things. All of these things are types of knowledge. They have nothing to do with cultivating attitudes or temperaments or virtues. They're not about character formation. They're subjects that students learn. We can't readily measure whether students have become more tolerant or open-minded, but we can measure whether they have, whether they have learned the methods the histories and the theories that we've been taught, because we have ways of assessing this outcome. They're called exams. Now, professional schools teach methods of inquiry that are relevant to practice in their fields, but they generally don't teach their subjects historically or theoretically. The purpose of professional education, this includes doctoral education in the liberal arts and sciences, is to deliberalize students, is to get them to think within the channels of the profession, not to achieve critical distance on those channels. Every law professor will tell you that the purpose of law school is to teach you how to think like a lawyer. The purpose of graduate programs in English is to teach you how to think like an English professor. Students entering PhD programs are sometimes a little shocked by how different the experience is from college because they're being socialized into a particular line of scholarly work. If they don't adhere to the canons of the profession, they won't get hired. But how bright is the line that separates liberal education from professional education? Almost any liberal field can be made non-liberal by turning it in the direction of some practical skill with which it is already associated. So sociology is related to social work, biology to medicine, political science and social theory relevant, are relevant to practicing law or to public administration and so on. But conversely, I think more importantly, any practical field can be made liberal simply by teaching it historically or theoretically. For example, some economics departments, uh, Harvard is one, uh, at liberal arts colleges refuse to teach accounting, despite student demand for it, because it's felt that accounting is not a liberal art, it's a trade. And maybe so, but one must always remember the immortal dictum, garbage is garbage, but the history of garbage is scholarship. Accounting is a vocation, but the history of accounting is a subject of disinterested inquiry. And the accountant who knows something about the history of accounting will be a better accountant. That knowledge pays off for him or her in the workplace. Similarly, future lawyers benefit from learning about the philosophical aspects of the law, just as literature majors learn more about poetry by being asked to write poems. If we can liberalize, and professionalize the same people separately, I don't see why we can't do both things at the same time. 
Liberal educators would do well to get rid of the 19th century bias against utility. The divorce between liberalism and professionalism as educational missions rests on a superstition, which is that the practical is the enemy of the true. This is a version of an ancient distinction between minds and bodies, between learning and doing. The combination of liberal learning and pre-professional training that you have at Elmhurst seems to me a very healthy undergraduate curriculum. It puts pieces together that historically have been segregated. That's just my opinion, of course. Uh, there's recently been some empirical work done assessing the value added of college education. And I'm thinking of a book called Academically Adrift, written by two sociologists, Richard Aram, who teaches at NYU, and Joseph Araxa, uh, who teaches at the University of Virginia. And this book, which I won't summarize in detail, concludes, uh, it's based on a study carried out on a single cohort of college students over the first two years of college, entering freshmen and second semester sophomores. They conclude, based on this study, that, quote, American higher education is characterized by limited or no learning for a large proportion of students, end quote. And since the book was published uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, they've continued to follow this cohort through the second two years of college and then into the workplace. And they published their findings, and they claim that the later studies reconfirm that many students learn very little in college, and those students do correspondingly less well in the labor market. Now, Aram and Ruska argue that, Ruska argue that many students today perceive college as no longer a learning experience. They think of it as fundamentally a social experience. They provide a lot of data, not just from their own study, but from other studies uh, whose uh, they've aggregated into their, uh, into their book. And they argue that students spend much less time studying than they used to. In 1961, students reported studying for an average of 25 hours a week. The average now is 12 to 13 hours. Over one-third of the students in their study reported that they spend less than five hours a week studying. The University of California survey, students reported spending 13 hours a week on school and 43 hours a week socializing and pursuing various forms of entertainment. Students study less in part because they're assigned less. They're assigned less reading and less writing than they used to, and they're probably assigned less because they study less. That is, professors know that if they assign more reading, students aren't going to do it. So assuming this is the case, and this is just one study um, that's been done, though this is going to obviously encourage a lot more studying of educational outcomes in the future, but assuming this is the case, that many students are increasingly disengaged from the academic part of the college experience, it may be that the system has finally become too big and too heterogeneous to work by offering the same kind of education for everyone. All those missions reflecting all those different theories have produced an increasingly thin institutional rationale. The system is drawing in large numbers of people who have no firm career goals, but it's failing to help them acquire goals once they are inside. At highly selective colleges, students are still super motivated. That's why they got into them. And most professors still want to make a difference to their students everywhere. But when motivation is missing, People come into the system without believing that what goes on in it really matters. It's hard to transform their minds. If there has been a decline in motivation, this may mean that an exceptional phase in the history of American higher education is coming to an end. That phase began after the Second World War, and it lasted for 50 years. Large new populations kept entering the system, first with the veterans who attended on the GI Bill, 2.3 million of them between 1944 and 1955. Then came the great expansion of the 1960s when baby boomers entered and college enrollments doubled in the course of 10 years. Then co-education, when virtually every all-male college except for military academies began accepting women. Uh, some military academies did, of course. And then finally, in the 1980s and 90s, there was a period of remarkable racial and ethnic diversification. These students, these new populations, did not regard college as a finishing school or as a ticket punch. They had much more at stake. College was a gate through which once only the favored could pass. Suddenly the door was open to vets, children of depression era parents who could not afford college for themselves, to women who had been excluded from many of the top schools, to non-whites who had been segregated and underrepresented. 
for the children of people who came to the United States precisely that, that, so that their children could go to college. For these groups, college was central to the experience of making it, not just financially, but socially and personally. They were finally getting a bite at the apple. College was supposed to be hard. Its difficulty was a token of its transformational power. Like anything else we care about, college requires a little bit of faith to do its work. Nothing that educators do to make the system more effective and efficient will mean much if the people entering that system don't believe in magic. And the professors have to believe in it, too. Because the key to reform in almost any area in higher education is not in the way that knowledge is produced, it's in the way that the producers of knowledge are produced. That is, the way we educate new professors. Doctoral education in higher, in higher education, doctoral education is the bedroom. It's where we reproduce ourselves. And despite transformational changes in the scale, the mission, the demographics of American higher education, professional reproduction remains almost exactly as it was 100 years ago. Graduate students are taught to become expert in a field of specialized study. And then at the end of a very long, expensive, and highly single-minded process of credentialization, when they get jobs, they're asked to perform tasks for which they've had no training at all, teach their field to non-specialists, connect what they teach to issues that students are likely to confront in the world outside the university, to be interdisciplinary, to write for a general audience, to justify their work to people outside their discipline and people outside the academy. If we want professors to be better at these things, we ought to train them differently. Still, as is the case with every potential reform in academic life, there are perils. The world of knowledge production is a marketplace, but it's a very special marketplace. It has its own practices, it has its own values, it has its own rules. A lot has changed in higher education in the last 50 years, but what has not changed is the delicate and somewhat paradoxical relation in which the university stands to the general culture. It's important for research and teaching to be relevant, for the university to engage with the public culture, and to design its investigative paradigms with actual social and cultural life in view. That's, in fact, what most professors try to do, even when they feel inhibited from saying so by the taboo against instrumentalist or presentist talk. Professors teach what they teach because they think it makes a difference. To continue to do this, academic inquiry in some areas may need to become a little less specialized, a little more real-world oriented. That may be down the road down which higher education is currently headed, but I'm not going to predict the future. But at the end of this road, there's a danger, which is that the culture of the university will become just an echo of the public culture. That would be a catastrophe. It's the academic's job in a free society to serve the public culture by asking questions the public doesn't want to ask, investigating subjects the public cannot or will not investigate, accommodating voices the public fails or refuses to accommodate. Academics need to look to the world to see what kind of teaching and research needs to be done and how they might better train and organize themselves to do it. But they need to ignore the world's demand that they reproduce its self-image. Thank you. Um, Professor Manan will take some questions. If you have questions, could you please come to the center aisle? Questions? You can also make comments. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Or comments. I wonder if you could uh, comment on accreditation. Um, I recently read a book by Richard DeMillo about, called Abelard's Apple, which I think is on a similar subject to your book. And he was very critical, very negative about the influence of accrediting a, uh, bodies on higher education. And I wonder if you have some perspective I, I on wish that. I wish I don't have any specific uh, knowledge about that. It is a constant thorn in the side of uh, institutions of higher education to deal with accrediting agencies. Um, and I, I don't have anything up to date to remark on that. Do you have observation you want to make about it? Uh, I'm going to try to uh, repeat what uh, Professor DeMillo said, but uh, he did feel that it um, that uh, accreditation had a stranglehold on uh, reform in higher education and was preventing progress in general. And he uh, marshaled a fair amount of data to make that point. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't surprise me if that were the case. Over here. Uh, 
Uh, it's a good question because, as everybody knows, the internet and the and the uh, whole world, online world, is transforming uh, what we do in higher education. And um, I promised I wouldn't predict the future, but the future is going to have to involve some accommodation to that fact of life. Um, at a minimum, the fact that students are accustomed to getting information online uh, and to multitasking and so forth is a challenge to traditional forms of pedagogy. So when I was in school, a guy like me stood up as I'm standing up here and talked for 50 minutes and people actually listened. You guys have been great, but um, uh, college students are not accustomed to that and it's not how they're used to getting information. So that's one challenge. The challenge that you raise has to do with the dissemination of knowledge uh, through the internet. When I was a graduate student uh, and when I was starting out as a scholar and writer, I every day put on my little miner's helmet and went down into the stacks and chipped knowledge out of old books uh, and carried them back up to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, ground level. And that was uh, that knowledge, that kind of knowledge that was not easy to get, that it required a lot of labor to acquire was of great value. And now in a lot of areas, particularly the stuff that I teach, students can go online and get that stuff in two seconds on Wikipedia. So the kind of esoterica, the kind of wrinkles on accepted information about things that I was able to acquire through a lot of arduous labor is, is not there anymore. So. What we do has to be not about giving students information because they get, can get information. They can get information quicker than we can get it out of our mouths to them. What we need to do is to show them how to turn information into knowledge. And there's a way in which that involves a rethinking of what it is we're doing when we teach uh, material. I think that everybody involved in education professionally believes that simply reading something on a computer screen or an encyclopedia in the library is not really acquiring knowledge. Acquiring knowledge requires an exchange with another person so that you internalize what you're learning in a way that you can't do if you're simply reading it off the page. When I started out teaching, I was told, as many people are, you don't really need to know anything to teach. Just go into the room and use the Socratic method. Now, that was a little glib, and we we should have known a little bit more about what we were doing than that. But the Socratic method is important because Socratic method is a way of getting people to learn things by making them understand that they basically already know it themselves. That's a little false, but it's a way of getting people by asking them questions about things to see that, yes, I wasn't really thinking clearly enough, but now if I think more clearly, I do understand this material. I do get it. You can't get that online. You need somebody there. You need an interlocutor there to do it. Um, so I don't think that that's a pious or old-fashioned idea. Now, is there a way of combining online education with the presence of a teacher in a way that will enable students to do that without having to travel all the way to a college or spend the amount of money it requires to be resident in a college? That's probably the challenge of the future, um, that people will do that. Yeah. So that's a very rambling answer to a question that's kind of central to where things are at right now in the business. At this very moment, there are four first round basketball games being played in the NCAA tournament. And hundreds of students have traveled halfway across the country or perhaps all the way across the continent to paint their faces in the school color and cheer on their favorite team. Uh, and so it seems to me, at least uh, perhaps I'd like a comment on my perception, that the promise of a social experience, the promise of the college as a playground, or in some cases, the promise of the college as a country club where one can while away one's time to put in one's time until one gets the, but makes your distinctions between the democratic and the meritocratic, meritocratic almost irrelevant, at least from the student's perspective. Um, well, Harvard is playing in the first round of the <laughs> NCAA tournament for the first time in, since 1946 or something. So um, I can't begrudge those students who feel important. <laughs> to show support uh, for the Crimson. But, um, I, but your point is, the, is a point I tried to address at the end of my remarks, which is that college does require to work, to, get, to, to transform people's minds in the way that we hope to be able to do. It requires motivation on the part of the students. If the culture of college is such that 
motivation doesn't exist and it's not fostered among students and their peers, there's very little we can do to change that. We can, be, we can try to be as exciting and demanding and rigorous and cool as possible, but if students feel that um, it's a matter of finding the path of least resistance through the requirements and the rest of it is going to basketball games, there's not a whole lot we can do to change that. Um, and I think that's a big question that we're all asking ourselves is whether that period of about 40 or 50 years when new populations kept coming in and changing the dynamic and, and, and making people excited about what was going on uh, may, have come, may have come to an end. Uh, I hope that's not the case. And I, I'm a, person, a theory two person. I think everybody should go. And it's good for democracy if everybody goes. But they have to also be getting something out of it. First, thank you for a very thought-provoking presentation. Um, in regard to the online question, I was driving the other day listening to National Public Radio, and they were interviewing someone who had established something called the People's University. Uh, it's a free online uh, group of courses that anyone in the world can sign up for. You register and you pay an enrollment fee based upon which country you live in, what your income is, ranging from 10 to $50, and then you are able to enroll in any courses that you want to. So that could be part of the wave of the future, too. The person who started this said he didn't think it would detract from enrollment in regular universities, that it might, in fact, boost them. Um, my question is about entrepreneurship. This past Monday, the Niebuhr Center here at Elmhurst held a very interesting dinner and dialogue with Dr. Bruce Fisher, who was talking about innovation. Yeah, mainly in the business world, but in other areas as well. And I'm wondering, what is, our, our, is the current college slash university system doing anything to foster entrepreneurship when you have so many of the top innovators who have dropped out of college to form their companies? So I'm, 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 I guess I'm asking, what is the lack there that does not provide for these people who are so creative and innovative, but do not find what they need in a college or university setting and end up setting up a company in, you know, somebody's garage. Yeah. Well, maybe they found what they needed. They just didn't need to get the degree. I mean, they did go to college. And um, they just realized at some point that they knew what they, they learned what they needed to know to start a business. I mean, unfortunately, most of us are not Bill Gates. Uh, so we could make that choice for ourselves, but I think we would probably be disappointed uh, in the outcome. Um, <laughs> But to answer your question in a serious way, because it's a good question, yes, there are media labs, innovation labs. It's a, definitely a trend in higher education to create spaces where creativity and what you're calling entrepreneurship can be encouraged. And they bring together people from different areas, different fields, often different schools, a business school and a college or a law school. Um, and they foster uh, that kind of creativity that you're talking about. There's no reason why universities can't be uh, places where people learn how to think imaginatively and creatively, whether it's for business or for uh, create works of art, whatever it might be. Uh, I have a comment, I guess. I think what you said about liberal arts education, maybe it's inspired, there's is uh, probably on point, but you've sidestepped all of the undergraduate curriculum like engineering, accounting, agriculture, architecture, those people don't have any questions about what they're doing in the future. The electrical engineers don't question their values. They just go and do it, and they're changing the world around us. And I think when you talk about uh, education at the undergraduate level, you should somehow work on the reconciliation of the liberal arts education as it's going on side by side with the uh, world changing education in the STEM disciplines. So um, that's, I guess, my comment. Yeah, I mean, with all respect, I did, I did address that part of college education. What you were talking about was uh, how to modernize and improve the liberal arts disciplines so that they can better prepare people and make better professionals out of them. And the professionals that you're talking about are 
academics, lawyers, and doctors who are really a small slice of what's going on in the world. And I think that the world is really being run by the engineers, for example, who are a different kind of category, but still an undergraduate uh, body of students, and, a, and an important one, and one that I don't think questions its values. Yeah, I, I did talk about okay. students in, yeah, I did talk about students in non-liberal fields. In fact, I said 60% of college students don't major in liberal arts and sciences. That, right, right, the, right. But, but students everywhere, no matter what their training, do take courses in liberal arts and sciences. That's, a, that's, what American co that's what makes American college experience distinctive. That's why people want to come here to go to college, whether they want to be engineers or English professors. And the question that I was addressing is, what is the value added of the liberal piece in this whole system much of which is designed to produce people in the STEM fields and people who are, you say, changing the world. I don't, I'm not trying to discount that. I'm just trying to explain why we think that the liberal college part of it is a valuable piece of the entire system. It would appear that in keeping with your democratic theory, uh, the online colleges and universities have taken it the democratization of education a step further. At the same time, it, it seems like the uh, online universities, and there's been a, a total surge over the past decade in online universities, uh, are they reducing the, uh, or, or are they simply bypassing the critical thinking that uh, comes with an in-classroom experience? So are we going to turn out a, a lot of unthinking people uh, and, and certainly one can say that uh, the online universities are beginning to pose a threat to regular universities, whether they're large state universities or smaller institutions like Elmhurst. Yeah, you're talking about the for-profit uh, for sector, which has certainly been growing <coughs> in the last decade or so. Um, and yes, they do represent a threat to the uh, not-for-profit private schools and to some extent to the public universities as well to the extent that they've identified a market for their educational products that was not being served or reached by traditional institutions. Um, and to the extent that they can provide an education to that market at a price that's affordable to it, they represent an economic competitor to the traditional institutions. Um, I can't answer your question without knowing more about it, whether the education they're getting is a quality education or not, except to say that there's evidently a great deal of consumer satisfaction. And that does put pressure on traditional institutions, just the way that buying stuff on the web puts pressure on stores, you know, stores in a mall. Um, and I think it behooves education, higher education to think about what the pattern of the future will be. So to my mind, just assuming for the moment that quality is there, it's a good thing because you want more people to have more access to more knowledge. That's just going to be good for individuals and it's good for us as a society. Okay. Uh, as I listen to you describe what it is uh, professors do or ought to do, I can't help but think that it must be similar to how you view yourself as a writer for a magazine like The, the New Yorker. And I, and I would be really interested to hear how working and for that magazine and having that platform and writing for that generalist audience has affected your thinking about what it is universities ought to be doing. Uh, thank you. So thank you for the uh, personal touch in that question. And uh, um, I would say that when I got into the profession, I wanted to write for magazines. And when I started out, I was very drawn to the study of literature at a graduate level and found the theoretical and scholarly issues absorbing. And to my surprise, because I thought of myself as a very introverted person, I liked teaching and decided it was good for me to do that. Um, and was lucky to get jobs, you know, which I wanted to take. And, um, but I always wanted to write magazine kind of writing. And I don't think it's because I felt that that's a nobler thing to do. I just felt it's like, it's what I can do. Um, and I like the idea of being able to communicate to 
a general audience of smart, highly educated people who are not themselves academics, subjects that I'm interested in as an academic. Uh, and to, by doing the research and then taking care with how I write it up, get those people engaged uh, with that. To me, that's a, that's a fun thing to do in life. It's quite similar to teaching. Um, uh, those of us who are professors have a scholarly thing that we do, but when we teach undergraduates, it's getting them excited about the subject. It's showing them there's something really interesting going on here. It's telling a story. It's getting them engaged on a personal way with the stakes of the discipline that we're trained in. And writing for a general audience is very similar to that. Um, so I've been very fortunate that I've been able to do that. And my academic colleagues uh, don't hold it against me. <laughs> um, and it's worked, out, it's worked out quite well for me uh, that way. Um, do I think every professor ought to do this? No, I don't. I just think we, ha we should all should do different things. We should do the things that we're good at. A, a professor who writes for a fairly small group of peers in a scholarly discipline, I have great respect for because it's pushing knowledge forward and it may be that only a few people can understand it. Uh, I don't have an issue with that, but I think it's wonderful if within every discipline there are people who can write for a bigger audience because it helps get that discipline out there in communication with people who are trained in other ways and who have other interests, and it helps fertilize the world, and that's part of what we're made to do. We're not supposed to stay in our silos. Uh, we're supposed to go out and rub shoulders with other silos uh, and make things happen that way, um, and writing for a bigger audience is one way to make that come about. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Manan, for taking the time to come to Elmhurst College for such an insightful presentation. I think I speak for many of the students here tonight when I say that it is a relief to hear you say that a college degree is most certainly worth the time and money. Um, I would like to present you with a gift on behalf of Elmhurst College. Okay. Um, I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening and encourage you to attend other upcoming events on campus. Lectures during this next month include KT McFarland on April 12th at 7 p.m. in the Founders Lounge on the Democracy and Global Security, our Holocaust guest ship featuring Eric Larson on Sunday, April 15th at 7 p.m. in the Founders Lounge, and Bob Woodward and Judge Bauer will present our final Democracy Forum lecture for this year, Truth and Justice in America. For additional information on these and other upcoming campus events, please visit our website at www.elmhurst.edu. Again, Thank you for joining us tonight. Our lectures are free, but they are not without cost. So if you've enjoyed tonight's lecture, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution to the Friends of the Arts at Elmhurst College. You can use the envelope in your program or just hand your contribution to one of our students, the ones with the buckets in the lobby. We greatly appreciate your support. Have a safe trip home.